Hello, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our Unleashing Your Wealth session today. So how are you all feeling today? Feel free to let me know in the chat. Are you feeling confident? Are you feeling optimistic? Do you have some questions that you need answers to? Just let me know in the comments and we will get to that in a few minutes, okay? So my name is Charity Ezenwa Onako. I am the founder of Wealthy Gen, and I am excited today to talk, talk to you about how you can move from income to freedom and unlock your financial well-being from any level of income. So if you have ever wondered how you can achieve financial freedom based on your current income level, or that ever wondered that you make about the same amount of income as your friends, but they appear to be on the track to achieving financial well-being than you are, then stay with me for a few minutes today. Because in this session, I will share with you the one thing that is your answer to all of these questions. And the one thing that only a few web builders understand and focus on on their journey to financial well-being, okay? So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. One moment. All right, so our topic for today is from income to freedom, okay? And if you noticed, the topic did not say from high income to freedom. It just says from income to freedom. And what this means is that you necessarily do not need very high income for you to start that part or for you to unlock financial well-being, okay? It means that anyone can achieve financial freedom or financial well-being because someone with a low income can achieve financial well-being. Whereas someone that has very high income may not achieve financial well-being. So it really doesn't depend on your level of income, but how you are able to make your current income, regardless of the amount, how you're able to make it work for you. So, but the one thing is sure for here is that you have to have some kind of income. You have to begin from income. It doesn't matter how much at this point, but you have to begin from income so you can move to freedom and then you can unlock your financial well-being, okay? So that's one thing for sure. With that said, let's get some facts straight. So in order for you to achieve financial freedom, there are three facts that must be present. So the first fact here is income, like we talked about. You must have to have some kind of income. We are not worried about how high or low the income is, but as long as you have some kind of income from any source, that is your starting point. But if you do not, if you are still struggling generating income of any kind, your first place to start is to have some kind of income, a basic income. And then later on in this, in this slide, in this session, we are going to talk about the different income sources that you can start with or that most people start with. And then we can talk about the different uh, sources of income that you can use to achieve this financial freedom and how you can make it happen. But the first fact is that you must have some kind of income, regardless of the level or how high it is or how low it is, okay? So that's the first fact. Now, the second fact is income depletion. So this is something that is common. Income depletion is driven by expenses. Now, I tell people that every income depletion is inevitable. As long as we are living, we must spend money. In fact, that is the essence of number one. The only reason money exists in fact, the general definition of money is that it's a medium of exchange. That is really the reason money exists. It is it's there for us to exchange it for us to get something else. So there must be spending. Everyone experiences income depletion. Some people say, if I have more money, I will do this. If I have a lot more money, I will do that. Keep in mind that the rich people, people that have a lot more money experience income depletion more than the people that would say have low income. So the more money you have, the more ex income depletion that you experience because you have more, you have more, uh, your choices might change. You have desires. Okay, let's say someone that doesn't have a car because you feel that you, can no longer, you cannot afford to buy a car yet. The moment you feel, okay, I can now afford to buy a car, the kind of car that I want, 
that expense is on that side. You go buy the car. Now you have to worry about maintaining the car. Now you have to worry about buying gas for the car. You have to worry about so many things that the car brings along with it. So the more money you have, keep in mind, the more income depletion that you have. So income depletion is a fact when you're uh, thinking about financial freedom and achieving financial well-being. So now the third uh, fact is what I call the change point. And this is one thing, if you do not learn anything from this session, think about income depletion, income replenishment. That is the fact number three, that is the change, that is where the change happens. This is one thing that, that differentiates the rich from the poor. Income replenishment is simply telling you, saying that everyone, let me go back, everyone or uh, many people have income, okay? Many people have income um, of some kind, then everyone experiences income depletion, but only some people have income replenishment. Income replenishment is really, you have this income, you are spending it because you must deplete your income. After you deplete your income, how are you replenishing the income you spend? I'm going to back out a little bit. If you do not get anything from this session, your takeaway from this session is to always think in your mind, how am I going to replenish the income that I am spending? So someone makes $1,000 every month. You know that in a year, you're gonna make 12,000. It's 1,000 every month, it's consistent, that's fine. Out of that 1,000 you're spending, let's just say 800. Some people will spend the whole 1,000, but we're not gonna to get to that yet. But let's just assume that you spend 800 out of your 1,000. What are you gonna to do to that 800? Are you just gonna let that 800 go like that? Now, rich people, people that think about financial freedom and financial well-being, will think I spent 800 out of my 1,000. I need to put it back. Not from your 1,000 you're gonna get next month. No, a different, from a different place. That's how you replenish your income. So that is one key fact that helps you achieve financial freedom. You, there's income, there's income deple uh, depletion, then there is income replenishment, which only a few people do. And we are going to get to how you can replenish your income in a moment. But I wanted to get these facts straight. Now, after you have all of these three things, <clears throat> we are going to go back to income, right? The basics. How can you achieve? What kind of income are we really talking about here? There, there are many uh, uh, different other income sources, but we are going to focus on the basics, okay? Because generally, a lot of people will have some kind of income. Maybe if you're employed, you get income from employment and that is called earned income. A lot of people just focus, have one of these income sources, okay? But some people run their own business. If you run your own business and you make profits from the business, that is profit income, income from your business. And then we have people whose full-time job is just maybe they're artists, they, they have music, they have, they, 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 they have music, mu uh, movies that they featured on. They get paid from that. That's their full-time job. They don't have anything else that they do. Those people have royalties. But there are still other kinds of realities, we'll get to that in a bit, but these are the basic, what majority of the people fall into. And some most people just have one of these um, income sources. Some have a combination of both, but generally a lot of people just focus on this. That's the basic income type, okay? Now, income depletion. After you've made your income, what comes next? Income depletion, okay? And as you see in this picture, people are shopping. People are buying, um, people are spending their money. Income depletion is inevitable. You're shopping, you're feeding, you're, you're, you're buying clothes, you're, you're, you're putting roof over your head, all right? That is income depletion. Let's take a, another one example about income depletion, okay? Now, somebody made $5,000 every month, but we are just giving an example of three months, okay? This person spends 5,000. And this is just an example where this person is not worried about building wealth. This person is not worried about financial freedom. I'm just living by from paycheck to paycheck, right? I'm expecting 5,000. My expenses, sometimes I exceed. Sometimes this example, the, the person exceeds 5,000 and maybe will have to um, 
tap into their credit cards or line of credit, right? So this is an example where this person has nothing left. They are spending everything. That's an example of income depletion. There might be some people that spend a little bit of this, but for now, we are just going to assume that this person is living from paycheck to paycheck. Maybe they're not lacking anything. Maybe their 5,000 is just enough to cover their monthly income, uh, monthly expenses, okay? Now, what about the next fact that we talked about, income replenishment? Now, income replenishment is simply telling you, out of this 5,000 that we saw in this example, how can we squeeze out instead of spending all of it? And that is one thing that, one question that I get from people a lot. Oh, the money I make is not a lot for me. I can barely cover my expenses. Like in the previous example, there's no room. They feel like I can not do anything. I cannot do anything else because I do not have enough money, right? But income replenishment is really telling you that you don't have to wait until you have a lot. Out of this 5,000 you have, out of whatever amount of money you have, squeeze out something. Because if you have, now this is a real fact. Uh, when you talk about money and finance, this is a real fact, right? If you cannot save a dollar from $100, if you make just $100 and you cannot put out $1 out of it, when you make $200, you may not be able to put out $2. When you make $500, you may not be able to put out $500. So the basic of the process, the basic strategy is it does not matter how much money you have. If you can just take out a little bit of it, it works. It, it, that's why a lot of people say talk about mindset a lot. Everything is in your mindset. If you condition your mind that out of this $100, it's only $98 that I have. Your mind will work with $98. And it will be okay. There will be nothing to come to take that $2 because you've told your mind, I do not have $2. I only have $98. Just like when somebody has one was ha or usually has $500 and eventually they have $1,000. Something will come for that extra $500. You end up spending the whole $1,000. But when you didn't have it, you are doing okay with just $500. That's how our, mind, our minds work. So out of your money, how can you squeeze out a little portion of it and put it aside? Let's take a look at this example. So in this example, someone that is focused on income replenishment is saying, out of my 5,000, I'm going to take $500 and put it away, okay? And it may be called it savings, right? But then the, this person's goal is to replenish this for the 500 that they are spending, not from the regular 5,000 monthly income, because we assume that this money income is from salary. We, this person is not, the income replenishment doesn't mean replace it with 5,000. No, because another expense is coming next month. Is you tapping into these extra savings that you put aside and grow it to bring in additional source of fund into this to replenish your monthly spending. Now, in this example, this person is replenishing only 50%. What the person did is, is, it did is to take all of this 1500 that he or she saved over three months, put it in a different income class. Remember, we looked at different income classes and we stopped at three. There are many more that we'll review in a moment. But they took this 1500 and put it into different other income sources, keeping the salary or the regular basic income consistent, but brings in additional 2300 every month. So what happens is if in three months, this person is able to replenish 6800 6, out of the 13500 that they spent. So in three months, if they just, this calculation here is dependent on they are saved, they already invested, right? And they just put this aside and save it and brought in more money. It's going to be 8,300. But if this person is starting afresh, then we would consider this 1,500 to be built into the income that is coming in. And that will keep their balance to 6,800. So the bottom line is depending on what level you are in, if you are just starting 
uh, in that journey of income replenishment, you take your savings, all this little, little money you put aside, it does not matter. I always tell someone, start with $50. If you can start with 20, even start with 20. The bottom line is for you to get started. Always think about, okay, it's time you spend money. How am I going to replenish this money back? How much of it am I bringing back? How much of these expenses am I bringing in? Okay, so that's your goal. In one year, if this person replenishes um, 8,300 of the money, this person will have 33,000. All right, so that's the key here. Now, after you replenish or after you save all of this money, how are you going to even use that to replenish? What kind of income replenishment are we talking about here? So this is now, once you put aside some money, this is what your income will look like when you start replenishing them. So remember the first basic classes, we talked about earning income from employment or profit income from business or royalties for music, art, movies, or even software, right? For those that have the, the thing in them to create softwares of their own. Now, if you are putting away that money, you will start earning interest income, you know, from your savings or investing to earn interest. Now, for it, the key thing with interest income is that don't just leave your money in a checking account. Don't just leave your money in a regular savings account that don't give you anything. There are several accounts there that pay you very high interest. You got to shop around and find them. I shop around a lot. And that discover those high yield interest, um, uh, interest high yield interest savings account because not all you won't just like you may already have known you you will not need to put all your money or tie up all your money into investment pools that may be difficult for you to liquidate. You always have to have some kind of liquid assets, money that you can fall back on. You know, in case of emergencies, and we're going to talk about that in a moment when we talk about financial well being. So high yield interest income is your go-to place for those kind of income or savings so that you can have interest income in your portfolio. Some people don't count it, but interest income counts, especially when you are you're able to identify high yield interest income. You can see how quickly your money grows uh, using that. And then that money you saved, you can use it to buy a property and rent it out for rental income. And some people may not even need to buy properties. Some people may already have one or two rooms in their home that may be wasting, or maybe because maybe they have three occupants in the, in the house, but they have like about five or six rooms in the house. You know, it's good, but when you're trying to build up your income replenishment, you're trying to build up your assets, you can put away some of those rooms and generate rental income for yourself. Or if you do not have those spare rooms to, to, to rent out, if you have enough pool of savings that you can use, you can invest in rental property. And the money you get from there is rental income. This is just another avenue that wealth builders explore to replenish their income. Keep in mind that if earned income is your main source of income, it does not go away. These ones become additional. These are the ones that replenish all your expenses, that's all your income depletion, all your depletion that come from your earned income or your profit income. Whatever your main source of income is, you, you are basically going to be spending out of it. Then these other streams of income will replenish your income that you're spending on, on your main income. You know. Then you can also take some of those savings that you've acquired, that you've pulled together, and invest in stocks. In invest for a share of a company's profits. And when you do that, you get paid dividends every time the company makes profit and they declare dividends to their owners. So dividend income is basically your share of a portion of a company's profits because you've invested in their equity. You've invested, become a part owner of that company. Dividend income is a great way for you to build your assets, for you to replenish your income simply because it does not stop you from um, your regular 
earned income if you are unemployment. It does not stop you from your regular profit income when you are running your own business. It does not stop you from your royalties if you are an artist or if you if you create music or other of those things. It does not stop you. So dividend income is just passive income uh, that just come in to replenish your spending, okay? So when you think about income replenishment, think about something that is a bit passive that you cannot invest all of your time in because you already have a major source of income that takes up your time. And then we talk about capital gains. Capital gains is when you have those pools of savings, you can use it to buy any assets that appreciates in value and then you can sell it, okay? So the key with capital gains is that you have to sell that asset for, for, for you to realize the gain. So if you buy, let's just say you bought um, a piece of real estate, okay? Let's say you bought a house somewhere, a property somewhere for, let's just say $100,000, today and then next year that house appreciates in value to 200,000 or let's say 150,000 okay you may have an increase in value of 50,000 it's in the books it's not real but the moment you sell it for 150 the $50,000 difference is your capital gains so capital gains is really buying and selling asset buying asset at a lower price and then selling it at a higher price than a higher cost than well, higher price than you paid for it. The difference is your capital gains. A lot of people do that for a living. They, you know, buy assets. It could be stocks. It could be, it could be any asset, and then sell it, and then capture the capital gains on it. That's another way for you to replenish your income. Then, you remember we talked about royalties before, and I brought it down here for a reason. So I would consider royalties in the first instance as people that do that for a living a lot of our, our movie artists really do that for a living that's all they do some of, uh, of our um those that are into music industry that's the, they don't have any uh paid employment they don't have probably may not have other business that's their full-time job okay but somebody that is in a paid employment that runs their own business may not do that full-time they may just write a book and put it out there, they still continue with their full-time job and those books will start bringing royalties for them. They can also have patents. You have some great idea, you patent it, you have rights to it, then you can sell your patent and people can use your patent and pay you some royalties on it. Then digital content is a big thing now in this phase that a lot of people are into digital content creation and they make a lot of money out of it. To some people, it's not their full-time job. They just do it and they get paid for it. That is royalties for you. So royalties can be a great source of income for you, either as a full-time um, project or just as, a, as a, a, a passive income for you that you can use to replenish the income that you are depleting. Because as we said in the first slide, income depletion is a fact. Everyone experiences it, whether the rich or the poor, you must deplete your income because that's why the money exists. But what you should keep in your mind is how are you replenishing this income that you're spending? Questions, please let me know. Put any questions you may have in the chat and we'll get to it in a moment. Okay, now the next question is how much of your income should you replenish? How much of your income should you replenish? Some people don't know. Okay, I spent $1,000. How do I even start? What? How do I know how I am doing? Okay, now the strategy here is for you to start with about 20% of your expenses. The strategy is to think, because it works with your mindset, like we said, if you make $1,000, or if you spend $1,000 every month, think about, you. start with 20%. How am I going to bring back $200 of what I'm spending? How am I gonna put it back? So if you spend $1,000, create another source of income that pays you at least $200 monthly. That is not your regular income source. So if you're in a paid employment and you spend, you get paid say 5,000 monthly in our previous example, and you spend 4,000 out of it. 
How are you going to replenish 20% of that 4,000? Think about that. And then once you get that income replenishment, once you get that income source, you put it away. Don't take it and go shopping, okay? Reinvest the $200 monthly for it to grow and make more money. And that is where the power of compound interest works. If you can put away your extra source of income and let it grow, let it compound, over time, you will build your way up to replenish 100% of your income or more. And this is how you build sustainable wealth. Now, sustainable wealth is income that continues to flow over time, even when you are not actively working. And a lot of people that are in paid employment, as you would know, a time will come when you're retired. A time will come when you are no longer strong enough to do all of those things, even when you run your own business. But sustainable income and income replenishment is what gets your financial well-being, is what unlocks your financial well-being because that time you are actively working. The moment, the period you're actively working or actively running your business is the time you put away all of these little, little investments in such a way that they replenish your income you spend. Now, take an example. Someone in our previous example, the person that made $15,000 in three months, 5,000 every month, and replenishes nothing. Yes, they made 15,000 and they are all gone because of what income depletion. But if this person is replenishing, just say, let's just say $1,000 every month. And let's just start with that, right? $1,000, I'm putting it back from a different source. And after three months that they have additional 3,000. So in essence, they spent all they have, but there's $3,000 waiting for them. So if there's nothing you get out of this class, it is you thinking about income replenishment. Anytime you're spending money, how can I replenish this income? How can I move from income depletion to income replenishment? Okay. Now, how do you know when you've unlocked financial well-being? How would you know? Because financial well-being can mean anything to anybody to different people some people will look at okay how much do i have in my bank account oh i do not have enough money in my bank account so i'm not i'm not achieving or i'm not there yet or someone might say well, i have a lot of money in my bank account i think i'm okay so it's important for us to understand what are the things that must be in place for us to say that we are on the path to achieving financial well-being or that we have achieved financial well-being if, we, if you if you might say so how do you know that so I like to share these elements for you. And these are really related to the things we talked in the past in the, um, when we started. But there are two elements and then there are two conditions, okay? Now, a lot of people use financial security, financial freedom, financial independence interchangeably. They may mean similar things, but each has a special meaning. Each has a role in the financial well-being, um, um, uh, will I say, you know, financial well-being scenario, right? Each of them has a role to play and they mean different things. So if you understand all of these different elements, then you can easily tell yourself, this is where I am. At what stage am I in this financial well-being journey? Okay, let's first look at financial security. Financial security means that, okay, that you are on track. You have the money in the present. You are focusing on the present now. You have the money to meet your daily and monthly expenses. And this is really what people call financial independence. So when someone says, I want to achieve financial independence, it means you are not depending on anyone for your daily and monthly expenses. That's it. Financial independence is good, but it's not the ideal scenario that you want to be at. The person that makes $5,000 and spends all the $5,000 has financial independence because they're not depending on anyone. Every day, they have the money to meet their daily and future expenses, but they haven't really achieved financial security. Now, financial independence, which really is financial security just in the present is really a function of your income and spending. Like we saw in that example, you make money, you spend it. 
How much of it are you spending? How much of your income are you depleting? This is really about income and income depletion, first and second fact. But then someone that is interested in achieving financial security will look beyond the present and think about the future. Now, if I don't spend all of my money, I'm going to save some for the future. It is only when you are able to meet your emergencies, your future emergencies, that's when you can say, I have financial security. If you are just meeting your day-to-day, -day, living from paycheck to paycheck, you can comfortably say you're financially independent if you do not depend on anyone to do all of those things. You are just getting by. But for you to really say, I have achieved financial security, I want to achieve financial security, it means you're securing your future. The future element has to be there. That means you're putting away some of your money towards meeting your emergencies when they occur. Because emergencies don't announce, they just come. And the, 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 the recommendation is to really have at least six to 12 months of your living expenses in a high yield savings account. I would say high yield savings account because you want to be able to access it because when emergency happens, you really don't know. So you want to have easy access to your emergency fund. So if you're thinking about achieving the whole financial well-being that we talked about, you want to make sure that you have the resources to meet your daily and monthly expenses without depending on anyone. And then you have put something away for the future so you can meet your emergencies when they come. If you look in your bank account and you have enough money, think of yourself, how much do I need to survive in a month? If you need, let's say, 5000 your one year of living expenses is $60,000. Whatever it is that your monthly expenses are add up to every month, think about getting at least six months of it. If you can get up to one year of it, fantastic. Put it away in a high yield savings account or you see this that we can talk about in a moment so that they can yield you more money. So they're not just sitting there idle, so they can bring in some more money that will help replenish some of your income that you're depleting. That's when you can say that you've achieved financial security. Then what about freedom? What about financial freedom? I know, like I said before, people use it interchangeably. Financial security is really not financial freedom. But they have a little bit of each or of each of the elements. So if you've achieved financial security, then the next is to focus on financial freedom. But then let's talk about the present. Because you talk about the present, you must talk about the future. Financial freedom in the present simply means that you have the freedom to make choices regarding how you use your financial resources. You make money, yes, but you have to have the freedom to choose how you use that money. You have to have the freedom to choose to enjoy life. A lot of people may not just quite or enjoy life because there are a lot of things holding them back. Maybe there's a lot of loans that they have that they can't quite spend that money as they like because they know that they have loans that they have to pay back. So freedom means you're free from anything holding you back. You can enjoy life as you wish. You can spend your money as you want. If you look in your bank account and you have $100,000, but $90,000 of that is loan. You think you can just freely spend your $100,000 anywhere you want? You, may, you will not have that freedom to do that because that money in your bank account is really not yours. There's a limitation on how or restriction on how you can use that money. With that, you have not really achieved financial freedom. Financial freedom means you are free to use it. You are free to use your financial resources and you are free to make choice to enjoy life. Financial freedom is really about quality of life. When you stop working, a lot of people, the question I have people ask themselves is now that I'm working full time, I can, because I have consistent flow of income every month, I can plan my life. I can plan on when I can go on vacation. I can save towards that. But if you should stop working, how is your quality of life after that? If you should stop earning your regular income, how is your quality of life? Is it going to change? 
If you are able to maintain your quality of life, when something happens to your main source of income, then you can say, okay, I think I have achieved financial freedom. Now, in the, in the present. And that's why income replenishment from a different source is important. Income replenishment says, okay, you have a regular 5,000 every month. What other thing can you do to generate income that does not require you being there, that does not require your time so that even if you are no longer able to work, maybe retirement or maybe emergency or things like that, that uh, income replenishment source of income does not depend on that. It will continue to flow. Quality of life. That's what financial freedom gives you in the present. But it's not complete yet. Because whenever we talk about the present, the key to financial well-being and achieving sustainable income or generational wealth is the future. You have to be on track at any point in time to meet your future goals. Because as you are now, there has to be something in the future that you are looking to achieve. You have to have a plan in the future. Okay, how is my quality of life now? How is my quality of life going to be like in the future? the next five years, next 10 years, or in the next 20 years, what kind of life do I want to believe in? That's the goal you will set for yourself at any point in time, but are you on track to meeting these goals? That is what financial freedom gives you. And now here is the key thing about financial freedom in the future. It's consistency. Consistency means if you are generating income replenishment, you want to do that consistently. If you're making $100 every month from a different income source that replenishes your spending, you want to keep that $100 consistent every month. And not just $100 every month, you want to grow it because when you're building the power of compound interest, right? You will see that your every month, it does not stay the same. Every month, it continues to grow. And when that growth is consistent, that's when you can say, okay, in the next five years, I know what I'm going to get. Because if I'm getting $100 now, I know it's not going to be $100 to next month. It might be 110 It might be 120 as the case may be. Now, for those of you, um, okay, so let's, let me, I, I will come to that point later. One way to ensure this consistency, one way to ensure that you are on track to meet your goal, meeting your goals is through investment. Investments can be in anything. It can be some investment in something that yields you royalty income. It can be investment in something that yields dividend income for you. It can be investment in something that yields um, rental income for you. It can be investment in anything that yields passive income for you that does not necessarily require your time. Now, one of the ways that we talk about this consistency as you choose your investments, is think about this investment, how consistent how am I going to expect this income that will flow from this investment? That's a question you have to ask yourself every time you're thinking about what should I invest in. For those of you that invest in stocks, that think about dividend stocks, before you even jump into doing that, take a look and see how consistent is this company paying dividends. That's the first thing I check. If they are paying dividends today, if they've not paid dividends in the past two years, hmm, chances are they may not pay dividends next, next this year. So you have to look back their history and see how consistent they have they been and how consistent is their growth in their dividends. So when you are thinking about financial freedom, consider now and consider future. And for the future, think about consistency on your path, Consistency on your part in what you're doing and consistency in the flow of the income that you're getting and consistency in the growth of that income because your income has to grow. It can be on your path, on your own. It can be a, a task for you to make sure that you reinvest your income because you have your regular income source. If you are paying employment, your salary should be okay. Spend your salary, whatever income replenishment you get, you replenish it again. You send it away to grow more so that your income replenishment continues to grow every time. Questions? So let me know if you have any questions and we will dive into that. This is an opportunity for you to ask me any question. 
um, I received one question during registration. And the question is, what investment options are suitable for those above 40? Interesting question, a great question. And we will definitely dive into that. And for those of you, if you have any question that you want to ask, please get ready. You can unmute yourself and ask, or if you want to put in the chat, that's fine. You can put it in the chat. But before we dive into this question, I want to introduce you to mobile, our mobile application that designed, created by me, of course, with the help of awesome team members that helped to bring it to life. Where the Gen app is just a money management tool that you can use to take control of everything your finances and all in one money management tool you can use it to budget to know where your money is coming from and where it is going every month you can use it to track your expenses and your income so that you can know where you're spending your money on and know which area that you can pull money aside to invest in those things that can replenish your expenses the key to achieving financial well-being is really having clarity about your finances. You have to know where your money is going. So you know which area that you can focus on, uh, which area of your expenses that you can cut back on so that you can truly, truly take control of your finances. So it's, it's, a, it's a tool that you can use to monitor and grow your network, and you can use it to set financial goals and commit them. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an app, it's available on, on your iOS app store. It, it is also available on Google Play Store. If you look in the chat, you will see a link there. If you wanna check it out, you can click on the link. It will take you directly to the app. So feel free to use it and let me know what you think. I really wanna know your, um, your take on it, but it's a tool uh, intentionally created to help people manage your finances so that you can stay on top of it and really take your finances to the next level, okay? All right. So what investment options are suitable for those above 40? I love this question and I get it a lot. And it is one question that people ask and expect a direct answer. Oh, go and inv go invest in this, go invest in that. And I say, I'd say this to mean that there is no one cap fits all um, investment options. Um, what works for me may not work for you. What works for this person may not work for you, but we are gonna go over those things so that you're leaving this place knowing, okay, this is where I will be thinking. This is the area that I'm gonna be thinking towards. There are a lot of things to consider. Uh, when we talk about investment, I, just so you know, we would have a class specifically for investment, but look out for your emails uh, because you would get notified each time we have sessions. Uh, but we dedicate a time specifically for, excuse me, for investments. So there are a lot of things to consider before you can say this is the investment that is right for me. And one of the, when we talk about investments, one thing that you will never go wrong with is risk. Risk is inherent in every investment. And it's important when you're thinking about investments to think about risk, okay? Now, let's take a look at the different types of risk assets. Because this, it, uh, we have, I have some examples here, but they are not... Um, Include all inclusive, there, there are, there's a lot more. We just cannot have all the examples in here, but that will give you an idea of the what we are talking about in terms of risk. Okay. So, but one thing is the general thing about investments and risk is that investments that have high risk will give you high returns, and investment that have low risk we give you lower returns. So those that have high risk will definitely pay you high returns to encourage you to bear the risk inherent in that investment. So the question you should ask yourself is, am I ready to take risk in order for me to get high returns? Or am I just okay, I don't wanna risk so much, I'm okay with the lower returns. So think about that. And then remember the question asked specifically for those uh, um, for those in their 40s. So age matters as well to determine what you can do. The first is low risk assets. Low risk assets simply means that's not a lot of risk in them. When you put in your money into low risk assets, you can generally expect to have your money back without any issues. And then they pay you, of course, um, a lower amount of um, returns because there's really nothing so much for you to lose. It's really almost guaranteed, right? That your principal is secure, there's nothing, you may not lose your money. An example is certificates of deposit. Certificates of deposit is really uh, you're, you're lending money basically to the banks 
it, depending on where you get your CDs from, it's like you're putting your savings and asking them, I take this uh, for a specific period of time. They are going to give you certificates technically the way originally how it was built, showing that, okay, they have your deposit fixed for a certain period of time. After this period of time, we are going to pay you this amount of returns. CDs are basically like the deposit, savings deposit, but you will not have access to it for a certain period of time. And they give you a fixed agreed upon rate of return on your CDs. It's basically risk, uh, low risk assets. Then treasury bills is like you're lending money to the government. Treasury bill, is, of course, is your government. Government doesn't fail, right? So when you lend money to the government, you're basically going to get it back. Uh, no matter what. So treasury bills are very low risk. Um, they also pay a fixed rate of return depending on where, what kind of treasury bills that you have. And then there is high yield savings account. Putting your money in savings account that pay you um, high yield savings is your savings account. You have access to your money as long as it is insured. Depending on where you put it, um, deposit insurance covers at least 250000 of your money. So if you have savings that are <clears throat> within or less than 250000 in the U.S., then it's insured. So there's no risk on that. If anything happens to the bank, the insurance companies will pay you up to 250000 But if it's more than 250000 that's when it becomes high risk. Because if anything happens to it, you may not get um, anything above 250000 back. So low-risk asset, there's a lot of other products out there that are really low risk. So these are things you should consider. Do you really want low risk assets that would eventually, of course, pay you lower returns, not as much as those that have maybe high or medium risk? So number two types of risk assets is your medium risk assets. They, 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 they have risk, right? But they are not very high, they're just medium. Think about your stock market, think about your real estate, think about your businesses, right? So for those kinds of assets, you're investing in business, there's medium risk because anything can happen in business, right? It's not exactly guaranteed. There's real estate at the same time. Markets can crash just like stocks. So they are medium risk. Of course, with medium returns, their returns are, way, are higher than the low risk assets because they are, the risk associated with these kinds of assets are relatively medium. Then you have your high risk assets. These ones are fluctuating like up and down, up and down, because anything can happen. Think about your cryptocurrencies, think about your forex, any high risk assets that um, you know that anything can happen and you potentially lose all of your investments. Those are very high risk assets. Now, what, which one should you invest in if you're in your 40s? Or even what we're going to do here, we'll touch on different um, age ranges. Even if you are not in your 40s, we have uh, something uh, that can guide your decision on that. So what should you invest in? What first is to consider your investment stage. What investment stage are you in? Okay. So first of all, you have to consider your risk tolerance. How much risk are you willing to take? But most importantly, what stage are you in? Because the stage you're in will tell you whether you should really take on high risk or not, okay? So the first stage is those in the beginning stage of your investments, those that are in their 20s and 30s, okay? This is the time you're planning. You're learning about investments. You may not really know how all of these things work, right? You're learning, you're planning your life, you, you're budgeting, you're saving, you're trying a lot of things, and guess what? You have a lot of time, and this is the key here. You have a lot of time to retirement. Somebody in their 20s, still have 40 years in their time, in their lifetime to retire, right? If anything happens to their money, they have enough time to bring it back. They have enough time to re-strategize. So these people in their 20s and 30s can take on high risk. That doesn't mean you should go ahead and do it. It means you can, you have the time, you can explore. Shrink. You can try some different things won't feel much. Seven minutes so that others can can hear please thank you uh, that is within us has it is not just so um this is the time you can explore you can learn different things right you can take on risk so if you are someone that really wants to make high returns you are willing to take risks if you are in your 20s and 30s 
Yes, you can explore. Tony and then there is, you can try Forex, you can learn about it, you can invest in it, you can invest in cryptocurrencies. That doesn't mean you are guaranteed return. It means that if anything happens, you have enough time to retrace your steps and re-strategize and do something else without being cut up with time. So that's for those in that beginning stage. Then for the accumulation stage, are those people in their 40s and 50, 50s. If you're in your 40s and 50s, this is the time you're building. You've explored, right? You've tried so many things. You've finished your trial and error. You've learned, you've <clears throat> learned from, you've made mistakes, you've learned from it. 40s and 50s is the time you accumulate your wealth. You are building your wealth, right? Together. You are now focused on, okay, I'm accumulating. I don't want to make so much mistakes anymore because your time is shortening at this period. You have medium time. Your time is beginning to be a constraint. You don't want to make so much mistakes. You don't want to lose so much money because you may not have all the time to build it up together. So you should take medium risk at this time. So for the person asking how much, what kind of investment asset you can do at this time, you can invest in stocks. Stocks is a medium risk asset, right? You can invest in real estate is a medium risk asset. So anything that does not necessarily, um, that is not very high, necessarily very high volatile, that has a very high volatility, you can invest in those things, being cautious and, and, and in, keeping in mind that you do not have a lot of time to play with. And your goal is to build, build and build and build and build. Then the last stage is the preservation stage. Those, if you hit 60, <clears throat> this is the time you should think about, I need to preserve my assets. I need to preserve whatever I have at this point. I do not want to take on so much to avoid losing your money because you do not have enough time to re-strategize. You are almost, you have a few more years to retire. And if you lose your money, you may not have the strength or the time to even build it back. So if you are in preservation stage, you are busy distributing, you are busy uh, building a legacy. You have very short time. So for the, those in this stage, you should focus on low risk assets. If anybody calls you for cryptocurrencies, run. If anybody calls you for stocks, eh, there are some kind of stocks that are low risk that you can do. You know, it, it's not advisable, but there are some very low risk um, out there. You have to really find those ones. But you should really focus on the low risk investment. Think about CDs. Think about high yield savings. Those things, you can think, think about your treasury bills, things you know that are guaranteed to safeguard your resources. Okay, any questions on here? So I'm gonna wait a little and see if anybody has any questions and then we can take on that. Any questions from anyone? Let me see if there's anything in the chat. Please feel free to let me know this is your chance. This is your time to ask before we call it a day. Okay, looks like there's no questions. So let me know how are y'all feeling? Did you learn anything today? I'd like to know your thoughts. Let me know what you think. If there's any takeaway from this lesson today, please let me know. I'd like to read your comments in the chat. Okay, well, seems like everybody's okay. Thank you all. I want to thank you for joining us today. Um, so here is our uh, the thing. Every month we get on this call and we pick a new topic every time. So look out for your emails for our topic for next month. Uh, we're actually going to talk about net worth uh, next month. So look out for the emails on how to join. Same process, you register, you get Zoom link to join. But we are really going to dive into net worth, how you can actually build our net worth and get it to a point where we want it to be, okay? So feel free to reach out to your social media, or email, here is our contact information. If you need anything, if you have any questions, let us know, we are here to help. And I want to thank you all for your time and this session today. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you all very much. Thank you, as usual, nice session. I joined late, but thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for joining. All right, bye everyone.